So it's been a big day in uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, specifically as it relates to Russia and Vladimir Putin. Putin gave a, a speech this morning in which uh, he did a couple of things. He announced uh, that he was going to support referenda uh, that will lead to the annexation, uh, or in other words, Russia saying that a bunch of Ukrainian territory is Russian territory. Uh, he announced a partial, what he called a partial mobilization, essentially calling up 300,000 Russian reservists. He made some not very thinly veiled nuclear threats against Ukraine in the West. Um, and, and generally uh, doubled down on everything that he's been doing in Ukraine so far. So I'm going to try to, in the next few minutes, uh, put together several pieces of this puzzle, talk about what it means. Uh, but, but big picture, um, this is one of the most important days in the history of the war so far, in that uh, it signals that having had some real problems over the last couple of weeks, Russia, uh, and Putin in particular, is not thinking about how to cut their losses or work towards peace, but rather doubling down. Uh, basically, I would say uh, taking what was originally a bad decision and doubling their bet on it. Um, really, I think there are four things to sort through. One is the, the background to this uh, speech today and these decisions was what's happened over the past week or 10 days, which is a big, uh, a massive advance of Ukrainian forces to regain territory in the Kharkiv region that had been lost at the beginning of the war. So really, um, not for the first time taking territory back, but taking a really significant amount of territory back and it happening in a way that basically had Russian troops routed and retreating and just leaving their equipment, cutting and running. Um, then mobilization, um, this nuclear threat, and this question of, of the referenda in occupied territories. So again, the background is, as of 10 days ago or so, really the first time that it looked like Russia might lose this war, right? Not just that they're losing some territory, but this question of um, the Russian army in retreat that's changed the perception of the war. Um, weeks ago, a lot of us were saying this war is going to break down, is going to sort of uh, um, uh, sort of slow down into stalemate. And what happened in the last week uh, did not look like stalemate. It looked like a rout of Russian troops. And there's this question, could the Russian forces actually just collapse? Um, and what does that mean? So it's, uh, I think, made people in Russia much more pessimistic. And there was a lot of pressure from the kind of the hardcore Russian right to say, we've got to do more to, to win this war. Um, and it raised a lot of optimism in Ukraine and the West that Ukraine actually might be able to win the war. Um, What's become clear in a military sense, and we sort of knew this, but I'm not sure we understood uh, or really processed the implications of it, is Russia is fighting in Ukraine on a front that's something like a thousand miles or more with something between uh, 150 or 200,000 troops. So there's just not enough troops to have a lot of troops defending any particular sector. And what the Ukrainians managed to do was to build up a, a bunch, a lot of forces in an area where the Russians didn't have a lot of troops. Most of the focus had been on this Russian counterattack in the south, along the north coast of the Black Sea in a place called <clears throat> Kherson. That was the big strategic target. And so Russia put a lot of its best forces there and Ukraine put a lot of forces there. Uh, but while that was happening, uh, Ukraine also marshaled some forces far away up in the north and, and basically said, that's really where we're going to go. And uh, uh, um, the Russia, the Ukrainian forces, uh, basically ran into some very weakly defended Russian positions and just pushed them back and routed them. Uh, so besides the general political sense that, wow, Ukraine can actually take territory back from Russia, can, can defeat Russia, um, there's this more narrow, clear sense that Russia doesn't have enough troops uh, to fight this war. And that really brings us then to this decision this morning, mobilization. One interesting thing I'll point out is uh, this speech was originally supposed to happen yesterday, on, on Tuesday um, in Moscow. It got postponed by a day. Um, it was supposed to happen sort of in the evening on Tuesday. It ended up happening Wednesday morning, Moscow time. That itself is interesting. It gives you an idea of how much on the fly these decisions are being made um, and organized. So what does mobilization mean about the war? Well, I think it's increasingly difficult for Putin to hide from the Russian people or from anybody else that this war was a mistake. Um, that whatever you think about the strategic purpose of the war, Russia's uh, desire to regain control of Ukraine, it was based on a complete misunderstanding of the relative capabilities of the Russian military and the Ukrainian military and what it would take um, to win. Um, 
but 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 more interesting, I think, at this point, um, although that is important because of of what the mobilization communicates to the Russian people, um, which is that the, so far the war has been a failure. Um, but for the for the future, um, it 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 implies something that's also scary, which is um, Putin's will to win this war is undiminished. Um, he's not thinking, oh, let's look for a way out. He's saying, okay. Um, we simply need to commit more resources. And he's been saying this all along, if we listen to him. He's been saying all along, um, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we're not going to retreat. Uh, and, and so I think we probably should take him seriously about that. Uh, the question, however, so so I should say that the um, his will to fight this war points us towards a long war. Because it points us to this, uh, to, to, to the reality, perhaps, and I say perhaps, that no matter what Ukraine does with the West's help, um, Russia's not going to give in. Russia's not going to look for an exit. It's going to continue to up the ante. Um, at the same time, the circumstances that have led up to this um, point to the fact that whatever Putin's will is, it's not clear that the Russian military or the average Russian soldier shares his will to win this war. And so there is now the big uncertainty in this war, sort of you might say the, the current strategic focus of this war is the morale uh, of the Russian military. Um, he, so he's, he's called up 300,000 more troops. Um, these are people who are reservists, meaning they've already been trained, they've already served, their service time is over, but now they're being brought back in. Uh, most of the people who are experts say it will take months to get these folks uh, retrained, organized, equipped into the front. So this is not something that's going to change the war quickly. And in fact, the faster these, these troops are thrown into battle and the less preparation they're thrown into battle with, the more likely it is that he's simply simply throwing them um, to their deaths. Because if they just go into battle um, untrained, uh, unarmed, unprepared, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll just suffer the consequences of that. Um, so that's a big, big deal. And, and, and we saw some protests against this in, in, in Russia today. Um, for Since the beginning of this war, Putin has resisted any kind of mobilization because he's understood how unpopular it is. And what, what's happening now is he's saying, I know it's unpopular, but we've got to do it because I'd rather do something unpopular than admit that I'm, I'm losing this war. Um, we're going to have to see how this plays out. Um, the, the reports out of Russia today are that there have been more protests against the war than ever before, although I don't think on the kind of scale that's really going to threaten Putin in any way. But the other thing you see is, is the Russians who are able to uh, voting with their feet, which is uh, apparently flights out of Moscow to... Uh, countries that Russians are allowed to travel to without visas, they're all booked up, they're all sold out. In other words, uh, the people who think they might be subject to this mobilization, um, many of them are just trying to get out of Russia. Um, uh, one assumes there will be uh, immense amounts of, of draft uh, resistance, draft dodging. Uh, people presumably will be bribing officials to try to uh, not, not be called up and so on. They'll be claiming sickness. Um, it will be a real interesting question and test the extent to which uh, the Russians are actually able to get the 300,000 people they say they want and get them into the, the war and get them fighting. Um, related to that mobilization has been a, a nuclear threat. Um, he's basically said, um, you know, if you attack Russia, um, we've got weapons we can use. And, and he said, uh, and I'm quoting now, he said, I'm not bluffing. Now, one of the funny things is most people regard when, when somebody says, I'm not bluffing, it often means that they're bluffing. The reality is uh, we just don't know. Um, we just don't know. You know, a lot of us did not think he would attack Ukraine in the first place. A lot of us didn't think he would go to, uh, you know, this kind of mobilization. Um, we don't know if Putin would actually use a nuclear weapon, um, nor do we know that if he decided to do so, whether his generals would follow those orders. Um, what I think is interesting about this nuclear threat is to ask the question, um, who is he threatening? In other words, who is he trying to communicate with here? Um, Partly he's trying to communicate with Ukraine, but I think he's also trying to communicate with the West. And it's not that he's threatening that he's going to nuke Berlin or Washington or something else, um, but rather the, the big Russian strategy at this point is to defeat Ukraine by undermining the West's support for Ukraine. Uh, Putin, rightly in some respects, right, blames the West for Ukraine's uh, ability to sustain this fight because the West, of course, is providing a lot of weaponry to Ukraine. And so this threat is really meant to, to make the people in the West think about an exit strategy 
um, while we want Putin to be thinking about an exit strategy. The other part of that, by the way, is still this uh, sort of cutoff of gas shipments to Western Europe, which are, are intended to put economic pressure on them. But I want to move on from the nuclear threat to talk about this idea of holding referenda in these uh, in, in several of the regions that Ukraine that uh, that Russia has conquered, most notably in um, in Kherson, um, but also in the original two um, regions that Russia invaded in 2014, besides Crimea, namely Donetsk and um, and Luhansk. Um, this seems like sort of silliness. Well, okay, you can hold these referenda, and of course everybody knows they're going to be rigged. In fact, they had talked about this for weeks, but then they had dis they had um, um, postponed them because they don't have enough control on the ground to actually do this. What he's now basically saying is, um, it doesn't matter whether we can actually run referendum or not, we're gonna do the best we can and we're going to annex these territories to Russia. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that these referenda are closely linked to this nuclear threat. Um, the goal is, or the idea is to say um, that these territories are not Ukrainian territories, they're Russian territories. So if you try to take these territories back, you're attacking Russia, and the nuclear threat then uh, uh, holds. He's trying to change the psychological and the moral threshold uh, of nuclear weapons use, right? I think a lot of people would say, well, of course, if we were to, uh, if the Ukrainians were to attack Moscow, they might, you know, use nuclear weapons against Ukraine. Um, he's trying to sort of change it so that so that the Ukrainians and the and Ukraine's Western backers. And the, and the Russian people start to think of Kherson, Luhansk, uh, Mariupol, uh, Donetsk, start to think of them like regular Russian territory, such that it would might seem reasonable or morally defensible to use a nuclear weapon to defend an attack on them. Uh, I don't think anybody really buys this. Um, but again, if you ask who's the target of the threat, in a way, I think he's probably talking to himself and to the Russian people as much as to the West, right? Trying to um, justify more and more dramatic uh, measures. Uh, and so this is a really, the combination of all these things, of the mobilization, the referenda, and the nuclear threat, he's not, uh, unfortunately, he's not merely communicating to a lot of audiences that he's a lot more serious about this than people may have thought, um, and that he's not going to back down but he's also created a lot more pressure on himself not to back down, right? The, the more he does these kinds of things, the basically the more face he's going to lose if he backs down later. And so increasingly, I think, increasingly it gets difficult to think about Russia uh, um, losing this war without Putin potentially being ejected from power. And while that sounds like a very good thing, Putin getting kicked out of power probably would be a very good thing, um, it also means that he's likely to do more and more desperate things um, to avoid that. Whether that involves nuclear weapons or not is, is an interesting question. Um, the last thing I want to point to is for all of this bluster and, and threat and so on, and I, sh I say bluster, I don't mean necessarily that he's bluffing, I just mean it's really powerful language. Um, he refers in this, in this speech that he gave today, he refers to the situation in Donbass. And he's actually said last week, and this kind of didn't get as much of attention as it should have, um, he, he, he made specific reference last week to Donetsk and Luhansk as the main goal of the invasion. Um, these are territories that, that Russia partially occupied in 2014. They said in, in, uh, in, in, on February 21st of this year, the day before the full-blown invasion, he said we're recognizing uh, their independence uh, in all of their territory, not just the territory that Russia controlled, but the additional territory in Ukraine. Um, the point that I'm making is he, he may have been sending some signs to Ukraine, to the West, to Russia, um, that, that that's a possible compromise. That is to say, as long as he gets Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts, those are the things he's mainly interested in. And if that were the case, I think that that's somewhere where you might head towards a possible solution of the war down the road. Now, I have to say I'm skeptical. I've thought from the beginning that more important strategically than Donetsk or Luhansk, and certainly more important than Kharkiv, where he's given up a lot of territory, is this area along the northern Black Sea coast, in particular Kherson. So I don't think he's going to give up Kherson without a fight. 
I think the, the fact that they're going to hold this sham uh, referendum in Kherson signals that. Um, but maybe, maybe, maybe there's a, there's a sign of, of where you might find some kind of compromise down the road. Um, so where does this leave us? The, the, there's been a lot more uh, chips pushed into the pot here, right? Uh, the, the ante has been raised dramatically for Russia, for Ukraine, and for Putin personally. Um, and what that means is I think there's still a long way to go, a lot of violence, a lot of killing, a lot of destruction, before everybody's had enough of this to say, okay, let's sit down and make some, some concessions, some really unpleasant concessions to get to a negotiated peace. Um, long way till the Russians are willing to say, well, we're going to have to accept some amount of retreat and humiliation. Long time before the Ukrainians are going to be willing to say, maybe we have to give up some territory. Um, so it's uh, none of this, none of this is, is good news, what we've seen today. Uh, and we'll have to see, again, just, to, just to, what to look forward to in the future. Um, look forward in the future to, on the one side, the morale of the Russian military, um, and on the other side, the unity of Western governments. I don't think we should doubt the determination of the Ukrainians to fight. That's not in question.